I want to change it, the, 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 the title of the message this morning to call it The Family at Ephesus. It's the same thought, but I want to call it The Family of Ephesus because I want to focus on the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul which emphasizes the unity and diversity of the church family. And the Apostle Paul begins by praising God in Ephesians chapter 1 for adopting believers into his family through Jesus Christ. And Paul bigs up the church's foundation in Christ in the book, in the book and its new identity as a unified body that is bigger than us and that is to outlaw every form of ethnic and social division. Paul explains in, in the book that the church is a dwelling place for the Spirit of God, which means if we're in a church, no arms house behavior like disrespect of God and disrespect of one another, no malice, no worldly and living with one foot in a church and one foot out, and no outer orderliness. And he tells us in the book that the church is not built on some rare thing that idle people say, but it is built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles, with Jesus as the head corner stone. Paul urges the Ephesian family of believers to live lives worthy of their calling to maintain unity and fellowship in the spirit. Unity and fellowship in the spirit, not fellowship in feelings. And he told him that the wider church family is a place that him show all kind of talent on. Family equipped with all kinds of gifts and roles. And he told him that the gifts are to build each other up in love, to do ministry, and to develop one another to do ministry. Brethren, that means that the church family is neither a kill dead business nor a place of idleness and busybodiness. Paul told Ephesians that the church family is to work together to reach maturity in Christ. In other words, they should see themselves not as individuals, but as a family. Not only as individuals, but as a family going somewhere together. Look at your neighbors and say, the person beside and say, we are family. But it don't sound like you're being it. We are family. Continue to repeat after me. I need all my brothers and sisters with me. Let's rise up and let praises ring. Amen. I've successfully mashed up the young lady's song. We are family. And he told him that church family must put away all the liars something. Let go of bad mind and grudgeful and practice unity and forgiveness. And throughout the letter, Paul emphasizes the church's identity as a family with God as a father, Jesus as our big brother, and believers as adopted siblings. It's all there, brethren. And he concludes by urging the church family in Ephesus to big up prayer, to stand up against wickedness, against evil, put on the whole armor of God, and pray all the time for one another. So overall, the book of Ephesians presents a very vibrant picture of the church as a unified, diverse, and loving family called to live out our identity in the Lord Jesus and to build each other up in love. Amen? You think I can stop the message now? So let me go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to 16. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord, Jesus and your love for all his saints and for all God's people. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So Paul writes this in the opening chapter of the book to the church in Ephesus. And in this verse, brethren, Paul is talking about his gratitude and his admiration. Can you see gratitude and admiration in that verse? Gratitude and admiration for two big things among the believers in Ephesus. The first thing that he is expressing his gratitude and admiration for is their love for all the saints. Let's go back to the verse 15 and just keep it up there. He's expressing love for all the saints and their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So he commends them for their trust and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he acknowledges that these people have real deal faith. And then he says, I want to big up your love for the people of God. And so he sees in this church inclusive love for everybody. Their affection, their care, and their compassion for one another. Not just for the chosen few or the frozen pew, but, a love, but love anew for the collective you. Let me say that again because it sounds even good to me. Not, love not just for the chosen few or the frozen pew, but love anew for the collective you. Now, if I ever see this poem in a book that anybody's selling, well, Pastor Bruce is going to collect all the royalties, right? Virgin, the Bible don't depend on us being intellectual giants and, and bright people to understand it, you know. And I don't have anything against intellectual pursuits. Let me just say that before we go any further. Yes? And, but, you know, sometimes I wonder why... Why do we have to go to the moon? You know how much money people spend going to the moon and Mars? And you know the problem with those places that nobody, you know there was no flu and cola in the moon and, and Mars before we go up there? And they spend a lot of money. Bright people don't look like them have a lot of things to do sometimes. And so sometimes even in the church, the brightness causes us to be confused about what the Bible says. But Paul points to two things that he has seen in these people. Things that tell him that the people are saved. And they're not just amazed by Jesus. He saw disciples who, were, who, who had moved from being amazed to being saved. I know sometimes you can spend many years in church. And all we are is amazed at Jesus. But we're not saved. And this is a time for people who are saved, not amazed. And he saw things that told him that these people's love was real and it was not what we used to call puppy love. You know what puppy love is? Genuine faith in Christ, genuine and inclusive love for one another. So as far as the Apostle Paul was concerned, genuine faith in Jesus and genuine love for people were to be, married, were to be a married couple And Virgin, too often in the body of Christ, love for God's people have a visiting relationship with faith in Jesus Christ. Paul saw a couple. He never saw any divorce between the two things. One is supposed to lead to the other. And if, this, if, if, it, if it don't look like that, something is wrong. And so I guess my question to myself would Paul describe me like that? I, I, I want to encourage that to be a question that all of us ask ourselves. Genuine faith in the Lord and love for God's people. And would he describe our church like this? You know, Bridget, I believe on, on these two matters we have heard from the Lord. We have heard from the Lord on these two things. Love for one another that is genuine and authentic and genuineness of our faith in the Lord, whether we really believe him or not. We have heard from the Lord on these two things. So Paul commends the Ephesian church family on these two things. And oh, oh what a beautiful commendation it was. Because it remains an abiding challenge to Christians of all generations. To have an earnest desire for that kind of commendation. But then 30 years later, Paul writes to the same church, sorry, not Paul, John is instructed to send a letter to the same church from the Lord Jesus Christ. The same church that is commended for their faith in the Lord and their journey in love. And here's what the Lord says to the same church. I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Oh, so many things can happen in 30 years. It's the same church. Some of the people who heard the first message from Paul's letter 
would have been alive at the time when they got the second instruction, the second challenge. And he says, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Come back to me and do the works you did at first. You can put on the slides, my brothers. Brethren, the first love refers to the church's initial experience of passionate devotion. Sell off love to Jesus. First love is about us being big time news carrier. Brethren, you know that it is okay. Christians are supposed to be the biggest news carrier in the world. Not of people's business, but of the good news of Jesus Christ and the kingdom. First love is about a people who are big on serving, big, big in the worshiping of God. First love is about close up, close up relationship with Jesus and real deal love for one another. This is what Jesus said, that the thing that you have 30 years ago, 30 years later, I'm telling you that you don't have it. A call to self-examination. And so Jesus saw 30 years after the letter from Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit that the love that this church had was like a schoolboy and schoolgirl crush fleeting and going nowhere anytime soon. They had lost the intensity and fervor that they used to have and their love for one another looked like something that was not associated with anything that named family. And so in a real sense, the challenge to the church in Ephesus, 30 years of the, after the letter from Paul, was a challenge from the Lord Jesus Christ to go back to Ephesians 1 verse 15, which says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. It was a direct message to the church that if they were going to please God, they must return to the initial passion for God that they used to have. They must return to their devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ and they must return to being a genuine family of God. Virgin, we are not relatives, we are family. And I remember I said to this psychiatrist some years ago, we are going to a function, I don't know what I said to him. And I said, you know, doc, everything is relative. And he says, yes, sir. I have a lot of those relatives myself. We are not relatives, Virgin, waiting. We are not relatives waiting, tolerating, and smiling with one another, waiting on the wheel to read. We are to be genuine, caring family going somewhere together. And let me just be clear, Bridget, the family that we're talking about here, so now, spread out all over earth and all over heaven. If you're not a believer, your family is just down here, sir. But if you're a believer, you have family all about. Say all about. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Paul says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derive his name. So, brethren, family down here, so and family up there, so. And we are part of this whole family that is united across the ethereal boundary that separates heaven from earth. The family big. And we are to be people who understand that we are family, not just passing relatives. And despite this burden, we are not called to behave in the world like we are it. You know, because sometimes, as Christian, we can behave like we, we, we're it. I always hear that people behave like they're the cat's pajamas. But I never see a puss in a pajama in my whole life. So I'm not even sure where this phrase comes. But we're not called to behave in the world like we are it. And that we're broad, but we must act like we're a Holy Ghost lit and large. We're having a family meeting, brethren, in the living room today. And we, are, we have house guests. We have some house guests. So let us talk family. Let us talk family. What is God saying to you, brothers, sisters, and house guests in this big family? Let's see what God would have us take home to our hearts and take home to our yards. And I say home because, brethren, the things that we're going to talk about shortly are applicable to both the family where we live, but also to the church family. Amen? 
So if we as a church family must please God like the church in Ephesus originally did through genuine faith in God and genuine love for each other, the first thing that is going to have to be evident is that, is that heart must minister through hands. Heart must minister through hands. It means we must do charity together, young and old together. And the heart of revelatory direction in Acts chapter 2, verse 44 to 45, the scripture says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to anyone who had need. So, brethren, charity within the context of the early church was a together business. It wasn't so much an individual business. There was a sense of collective responsibility for doing charity together. And that does not mean we can't do things on our own. But our faith and love for Jesus and others must lead us to do good works. And we must follow the early church pattern of doing things together. And so when we read Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, that says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We must see it within the context of a call to do things together, to do charity, to do good works together. And so, Bridget, let me just say, the community ministry initiatives in this church needs to be a church effort it can't be Karen Gordon and some people. It has to be a church effort. And we can't do everything at the same time. But we must do charity together. And I want to speak to the people who are my age. Because you know I am a millennial. And if you don't believe it, just ask my wife. I speak to my age group. You know I said to Auntie Karen one day. Where are the young people? And Auntie Karen um, wasn't able to give me a good answer why the young people were. The younger people were not present in the pre market. And so when we came on that day, the only young people on that day was Burjik and myself. If we're going to be like a church in Ephesus that please God, heart, heart must minister through hands. I want to say that to your neighbor. Hands must minister through, heart must minister through hands. It cannot be one set of people playing a game and the rest of us buying shoes for them and cheering them from the grandstand. Family is a team sport. If Ephesians 1 verse 15 is the heart of the family, then Ephesians 2 verse 10, which calls us to good works, calls the heart to minister through the hands of the family in joined up action. Amen? The second thing that if we as a church family are going to please God like the church in Ephesus, heart must also minister to heart. Which means we must practice and perfect love together. Brethren, love has to show up in forgiveness. Love must show up in mercy. And love must show up in compassion. Yesterday, we, we Auntie Paulette, John Barney, myself, Dwight Fletcher from TLC, and somebody from Webster, we went to do this small group training to prepare some people for a different kind of follow-up from a crusade that is happening in St. Catherine. We expected 20 people and 60 odd people showed up. That was God at work. And a lady sh shared with me how in the church, in the context of church, how this one said, boy, they're not praying for this one, you pray for her. I mean, you pray for her, me not pray for her. In a church, I know I don't have anything to say to her. In church, worshiping people in church, brethren, love, as I see it in the Bible, cannot exist without forgiveness, mercy, and compassion. And this is a way to test our, the, the quality and the authenticity of our love for one another. Is it characterized by forgiveness that is genuine? 
Is it characterized by forgiveness? Is it laced with compassion? Virgin, we can't be like the people on Facebook who spend the whole of them time a cuss off one another. I have a plan to write a book, you know, it's called Lace Book, Facebook, and Trace Book. The Jamaican experience. No, I've already copyrighted the title, so all the plans to do that. Virgin, in the church, love, love must be characterized by F. MC, forgiveness, mercy, and compassion. Heart must minister to heart. Brethren, if these things are missing, we are just waiting on the funeral to fight over dead left. And so in Ephesians 4 verse 31, Paul says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. In other words, the love that Paul saw and commended this church for in chapter 1 verse 15 should lead to healthy loving relationships within the community it is a call to live out our love for the lord jesus christ and others in a way that promotes unity understanding and harmony within the body of christ brethren the church is not a police station to look for crimes to angrily accuse one another put them in the guard room lock them up give them a backbench punish them and write them off as convicts until jesus come back with the big belt that's what the church is supposed to be a hospital where we care for people, where we address wounds that people have experienced, where we deal with compassion, with mistakes that people make, and restore them in a spirit of gentleness and humility. The church is not a police station. Heart must minister to heart. We are told in Ephesians chapter 5, Paulo God's example as dearly beloved children and walk in the way of love. The third thing that must be evident if we're going to please God like the church in Ephesus is that heart must minister to soul. Brethren, we must as family cling together during this stress. We, Paul says to the church in Ephesus, in chapter 4, verse 32, he says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Virgin, this, this verse told that church family that they must show kindness, empathy, and understanding towards one another, especially in times of distress. Paul told the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And this burden means that family must carry one another's burdens. And this means supporting one another in distress, in struggle, in hardship, in emotional, physical, and spiritual anguish. All of these things can damage people's souls and make us unhealthy. Because guess what, brethren? In this world, we're going to have trouble. That is a lot of the human being. Job says that man born of woman is, is, is few, days in, few days on this side of eternity and full of all kinds of trouble. Brethren, stuff happens to every human being. Unbelievers go through crosses. But what do Christians go through? Trials and crosses. We at times, every one of us needs somebody to come along and say to us, press along, Mike, press along in God's own way. Persecution, we must bear trials and crosses in our way. But the hotter the battle, the sweeter the victory. If Ephesians 1 verse 15 is the heart of the church family, then Ephesians 4 verse 32, which calls us to be kind and compassionate to one another, calls the heart to minister to the soul of the family. Fourthly, if we as a church family must please God like the church in Ephesus, heart must also minister through feet. Which means we must work as trusted brothers and sisters in the family business together. 
Not take out the family truck to run our own little farming business when we have a mind to and carry our own Irish potato to market. There is work to be done here, so we, we are called, brethren, but to a place where the heart of the church must minister to the feet of the church. We are called to do things together. And it don't mean we can't do things on our own. But we are called to do some things together. Heart must minister through feet. The family business is about making disciples. If we are not doing this, we are tending our own business and not the family business. Virgin, my heart was really broken in the last couple of weeks in a, in a positive way. Went to Germantown and spoke to a 93-year-old man who was in the church when my grandfather planted this church. And I heard the man saying all kinds of wonderful things about the ministry in Germantown. But what he didn't know was the story in the family that we knew. Where my grandfather... Is called by a man, a man named Elder Archer, who was then the county overseer for the New Testament Church of God. His son became the spelling bee man in another dispensation. And Elder Archer said, I want you to go to Germantown to go address a matter. And he started a church. But how did he go? He went to the Brownstone Market. And he was waiting on a transport. And the transport at the time was a cart and donkey. That was the transport. And he waited in vain and he couldn't, he couldn't find any transport. And so he sent the two children who could travel at the time on a cart because a man said, I'm, no go I'm going to go to Trelawney, but I can't carry you because I didn't sell off all of what I had and therefore I have load to go back to Trelawney. And so my grandfather put the two children, one of them who was here with me last week, and he's now gone back. He was here and was at the funeral and so on. And he's the one who told me the story because he was one of the children. He was, at the time, an eight-year-old child. And my grandfather put him and his sister on the cart with a man who he don't even really know about them. Just know him from the market. You know country, you know the man from the market. And the two of them traveled from Brownstone to Ulster Spring on the cart And Pastor Melvin Makanov, he walked all the way from Brownstone to Ulster Spring to answer the call of God. He reached the next morning, tired, mash up. And my uncle told me that he went to stay with a woman. And the woman, every night is pure crying underneath the house. And they don't know who are crying. And they look, they don't see nobody. And my uncle says, my grandfather stomped his foot twice and spoke in some out of world language. And that was the last night of the crying in the place. And the man who I met last week said there was a whole revival. People come from Albertown, Ulster Spring, wherever, Duncans, came, all kind of revival in this little place in Germantown. Because a man decided that he would make sacrifice and walk all the way from Brownstone to Ulster Spring. Because he understood that the call upon his life was to make disciples on this side of eternity. He knew what the family business was. So... Brethren, I want to just challenge cell groups. Cell groups need to do outreach together. The men's ministry as an affinity group must begin to do outreach together. The women's ministry in this church as an affinity group must begin to do outreach together. Youth and young adults as affinity groups must do outreach together. The whole away must do outreach together. And I know we can't be everywhere all the time. But the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 15 as he closed the book, with your feet fitted, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Ephesians 1 verse 15, that reflects the theme of the gospel and its impact on the lives of believers. Cannot be delinked 
from this call to have our feet fitted with the readiness from the gospel of peace. The faith and love that Paul saw in the church in Ephesus are fruit of the good news of the kingdom and the risk of the Lord Jesus Christ of human beings. This verse calls us as family members in the family of God to be ready to share the same gospel with other people. And this call that I am referring to and emphasizing this morning, this call to togetherness in outreach is clear in another church family, in the Thessalonian church family. In 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 78, Paul says, you, you Thessalonian church family became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. That is what we want to be spoken of about this church. That our togetherness in the family business of making disciples begins to ring out beyond Kingston, all the way to St. Elizabeth, where Sharon comes from. Up the road and down the road and cross the river. Brother Lord, this is a season where this church, in the matter of making disciples, must be able to cross it. And I'm talking to a river man. And I'm going to come down. I am coming down. If we're going to be like a church in Ephesus originally, heart must also minister to table we must make family fellowship and thanksgiving a thing. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 5 verse 18 to 20, we mustn't get drunk on wine or smirn off. Your Bible don't say so. Well, check me afterwards and I will show you. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Virgin, it is about speaking to one another with psalms and hymns from the Spirit. It's about fellowship for mutual encouragement. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 16, the prophet records that those who fear the Lord talk with one another. Talk with who? Did they say talk with God? Talk with one another. And the Lord did what? Listen and heard. Virgin, whenever we are fellowshipping and we are talking with one another, God is eavesdropping on our conversation, but he's eavesdropping for purpose because he wants to do something. And we are robbing ourselves of the opportunity of God's response because God is an eavesdropping God when it comes to the people of God. He wants to hear us talking to one another. And so this, I, so will, you know, boy, you know, I, I, you know, I will talk to God on my own. You know, I am, I am quite okay with talking to God on my. Well, the, the Bible said they were talking to one another, and the Lord listened and hear. When we are talking to one another, brethren, God is intelligent enough to, to, enough to know. Says Him, we are talking to. to? And a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Brethren, it is not just about fellowship for mutual encouragement, but it is also knowing that God answers us out of our times of fellowship with one another. And to the extent, brethren, that we deny ourselves investment time in fellowship, we are missing an opportunity for God, the eavesdropping God, to hear us and to answer us. Or oh, you're not interested in the eavesdropping God? You're only interested in the God that you can call on your cell phone? Well, God wants to respond to people talking to one another in the family. Because that is the role of father. To hear children talking to one another and then come up and say, Oh, you know, I heard you talking and I'm going to do something about what I heard you talking about. If Ephesians 1 verse 15 is the heart of the family, then this verse calls the heart to minister to the table. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms. And lastly, if we're going to please God like the church in Ephesus, heart must also minister through knees. And brethren, the family must turn up for family times of prayer. The family must turn up for the family times of prayer. And so this last point I'm preaching 
I'm preaching with a clear intention that Pastor Harry is going to pay me a lot of money for sharing what I'm going to share now. But it is not a reward on this side of eternity, brethren. The family must turn up for times of prayer. One of the things I must tell you that I've learned having been married into a strict family with strict parents and a strict wife is that, you know, you go to country and you know, say, at whichever time of the morning, I don't remember if it's six o'clock, they're over there. Two people that are witnesses are sitting over there looking glum. You have to get up because my mother-in-law is having prayer meeting. I don't matter what your age is. It don't matter what your stage is. It don't matter what your wages. It don't matter what your experience is. It don't matter what your intelligence You better get up. And if I don't get up, then the children, my children, are not going to get up because they're going to see me out there. There is no exemption for family prayer. Praying for one another is both obligation and command. In Ephesians 6 verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So do it all the time. Pray different kinds of prayer, thanksgiving, confession, supplication, intercession, all kinds of prayer, and pray for all kinds of things. We can't want it better than that. Corporate prayer meetings, brothers and sisters, are family meetings. They are not occasions for other things that we can postpone or deprioritize. Those of us who lead must lead by being an example of commitment, not by following upon others. Brethren, if, we are, if the people who lead, and there's 120 people on the servant leadership chat group in this church, by the time I finish this message, all the leaders are going to ban me from the pulpit. But I'm going to say what I have to say because I have to work while it is still day. Those who lead must lead by being an example. If you don't turn up to family times of prayer, then, 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 then people are not going to give, you any, give us any moral authority to talk to them about why they were not there. The family prayer time is where I catch burdens from the bigger father. It's where I, I hear leadings from those appointed to provide fathering over the host. It is where I hear things the big father has whispered to others as we pray. It is where I sit together with others in the privilege of running the universe through prayer. By working with God and using my mouth in petition, it is a place where in the rendering of my faith as we agree, I benefit, it is the place where I come together with others to tear down strongholds over the house and the family and the nation. It is where I get instructions for my life, where I am unburdened to live. It is the place where I am encouraged to believe God. It is the place where I am healed. I still remember the church praying led by Alison Nichols one day. When I was really sick, Virgin, from that day, the healing began to manifest. It was a powerful time when the church was gathered and I could even be there. It is the place where we hear God for our issues as he speaks to us. It is the place where I learn intercession skills because when I die and go to heaven, I'm not going there to be idle. It is a, faith, a place where faith is built as we participate in the assembling of for prayer. That brings the anointing. Brethren, if Ephesians 1 verse 15 is the heart of the family, then Ephesians 6 verse 18, which calls us to pray all the time, all kinds of prayers, for all kinds of things, calls us to a place where heart must minister through knees. If we as a church family are going to please God, like the church in Ephesus, we must be a people who understand that we are called to go somewhere together. Heart must minister through hands. Heart must minister to heart. Heart must minister to soul. Heart must minister through feet. Heart must minister to table. And heart must minister through knees. How then shall we live?
I want to leave you with a challenge. Are you loving each other like family? Are you living with each other like family? And are you laboring together as family? Amen.